I was just wondering what proportion of my peripherally circulating arterial blood is oxygenated? What percentage of the haemoglobin in that blood is saturated with oxygen? Because if I knew that, that would tell me how much oxygen is combined with haemoglobin in my systemic arterial system. Ah, oh, here's an oxygen saturation probe. I can use this to find out. So here's my oxygen saturation probe, just turn that on. And uh, here's my finger. So I'm going to put my finger in it and we'll see what we get. Always a bit strange looking at your own physiology. So we see here that my blood is actually 99% saturated and my heart rate is about 80 beats per minute. That information comes up quite nicely on that probe. Now this is registering fairly nicely on me at the moment because I've got quite a good peripheral pulse. But not all, all of our patients have a good peripheral pulse at the time we're taking the measurements. So it's a good tip sometimes if you're not getting a reading on a finger then you can use the thumb because the thumb has got a bigger arterial pulse within it and that can sometimes be detected. So we see that my oxygen saturation is still 99% which is fine, and my heart rate's in the high 70s. Now, these haemoglobin in my red blood cells, and in fact about a third of the volume of my red blood cells, the erythrocytes, is made up of haemoglobin in the cytoplasm. And of course, in fact, this is why blood is red, because of the large amounts of haemoglobin molecules. I'm just going to keep an eye on my saturations actually just in case anything goes wrong. See what's going on. There we are. Heart rate 77, so our saturation is 95. And um, biochemists tell us there's 270 to 300 million <laughs> haemoglobin molecules per red blood cells, per red blood cell in these individual relatively short-lived red blood cells. They live for about 100 to 120 days. Now, of course, oxygen is vital, so we need to know the patient's oxygen levels. We need to know this for diagnosis. For example, if it's low, they may have some sort of chest condition. They may have a pneumonia or chronic bronchitis, for example, that's lowering their saturations. And we need to know this so we can treat the patients, possibly with oxygen therapy, and so we can uh, titrate treatment as well. And what we're actually measuring here is a SPO2. The SP stands for uh, saturations of peripheral oxygen because we're looking at it in the periphery. I'm using a finger at the moment, but you can also use ears. You can use noses, and if they're well perfused, you can use toes as well. It's measuring peripheral oxygen saturations. Now, even though it's measuring peripheral oxygen saturations, it's going to be an indication of the oxygen saturations in the systemic arterial blood supply. Now, if you've watched previous videos in this series, you'll recognize this diagram here. So in this diagram, we see that deoxygenated blood is being pumped to the lungs and it's being oxygenated and when it's oxygenated it's returned to the left side of the heart goes to the left ventricle and that is pumped out into all of the systemic circulation so all of the systemic circulation is receiving its blood supply via the aorta So this blood is going from the aorta to supply blood to all of the body. So all of the body is being supplied with blood from the aorta. 
So this blood is oxygenating the body. And as the blood goes through the body, it's going to be deoxygenated, of course. But we're measuring the blood in the systemic. We're measuring the amount of oxygen in the blood in the systemic arterial system. That, that's what we're measuring. I'll just keep an eye on mine, actually. I don't want it to start going down or anything. Let's just see what we're doing. Oh yeah, still 98% saturated. That's okay. Just keep an eye on that there. Ninety-seven percent saturated. Heart rate is currently uh, eighty, so I'll accept that. So we're measuring the oxygen in the uh, systemic arterial system, and this is the peripheral saturations of peripheral oxygen. Now these machines are remarkably clever. When I was young, we didn't have them. We had to gauge if a patient was becoming hypoxic by seeing if they were cyanosed or looking for increased respiratory rate or increased heart rate but now these saturation probes are just brilliant now it contains two light emitting diodes there's a, a red light emitting diode and there's an infrared light emitting diode and the red light emitting diode is it, the red light is absorbed by reduced hemoglobin now reduced hemoglobin means there's less oxygen what we might call deoxyhemoglobin. And the infrared light is absorbed by oxyhemoglobin. That is the highly oxidized form of hemoglobin. And there's a sensor that on the other side, see the probes in two parts. So the light comes in one part and there's a sensor in the other part. And, and what this means is that if, uh, if there's more reduced hemoglobin, that is, is if the saturations are low, there's going to be more red light absorbed. And if there's more red light absorbed, that means less is arriving at the detector. So it's going to show lower oxygen saturations. And the computer in here works all that out. It's very clever. But if there's more oxygenated haemoglobin, if the blood is high in oxyhemoglobin, then more infrared light is going to be absorbed. So more infrared light is absorbed so that means less infrared is arriving at the detector and the machine interprets this as higher oxygen saturations. Quite amazing piece of computational power in there. But, there's always buts of course. It's so many of my patients wear nail varnish and, and that messes things up. So if the patient's wearing nail varnish, put it on sideways like that. It works, it still works. Put it on sideways. Let's just see if that's working in me. So it's now going sideways through my finger. Yep. So saturations are 97, heart rate is 76. So remember nail varnish will mess that up if your patients are wearing nail varnish. This is why of course we don't allow patients to wear nail varnish if they're in hospital and uh, especially if they're going for surgery or something like that, because we don't want to mess up the saturations. But we can also uh, have problems with dirty sensors. So you can actually see there, see the lights coming from, I'll turn yourself off, put my finger back in. See the light is coming from uh, that side. You saw the light there, see the light on my finger there. And it's absorbed on the other side, it's absorbed on that side. So um, if the sensor's dirty, that can mess up the recording. So we have to clean the sensors from time to time. Bright lights can be another problem. So if we're in bright sunlight, that can affect the, that can affect the receiver of the light as well, or, or theatre lights. More commonly, dirty hands. Dry blood is a big problem. So make sure the patient's finger has got no dry blood on it. And another problem is if the patient's peripherally shut down. If, if there's a peripheral vasoconstriction and the blood's not getting to the peripheries, this is really common actually. So this could occur in any situation where the patient is shocked after an arrest, if they're hypothermic, if they're hypovolemic, all these, thing, all these things will reduce peripheral circulation. Sometimes then it will work in an ear or, or a nose or adrenaline infusions can cause peripheral shutdown as well. 
And there's a really important one to tell you about at the moment. And the, the really important one to tell you about is carbon monoxide. Now, if there's carbon monoxide breathed in, that will combine with the haemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin. So we'll get carboxyhemoglobin in the blood. So carboxyhemoglobin is the combination of carbon monoxide, that is CO, and haemoglobin. And carbon monoxide binds 250 times more strongly than oxygen. So carbon monoxide binds really strongly to the haemoglobin and it just tends to stick there. It stays there for a long time. And so if patients have been in fires, for example, they can have a lot of uh, carboxyhemoglobin. Smokers will have uh, more. And patients that have um, been exposed to a lot of exhaust fumes as well can have a lot of carboxyhemoglobin in the blood. And the carboxyhemoglobin is detected by this sensor in the same way as oxyhemoglobin. So you can have a patient after a fire and their blood is all clogged up with uh, carbon monoxide, but they could be showing 100% SATs. So that's the time when it can catch you out, when there's a lot of carbon monoxide in the blood. So bear that in mind, and if the patient has been exposed to carbon dioxide, put them on high flow oxygen to try and, uh, to try and wash it out. Now, another thing here is what this is measuring, mine's 99, 98 at the moment, this is actually measuring the percentage of the haemoglobin that is saturated with blood. It is not telling me how much haemoglobin is there. So maybe I've only got half as much haemoglobin as I should have if I've been bleeding or if I'm very anemic, for example. So if I've got half the haemoglobin I should have at the moment, my haemoglobin is very low, it could still be 99% saturated. So the haemoglobin I have is 99% saturated, but because I've only got half the amount of haemoglobin, you can see that's going to basically halve the amount of oxygen that my tissues are getting. And this is what's vital, really. I mean, this is interesting, but what is vital is how much oxygen is actually going to the tissues. That's what we really need to know. So think about uh, patients that are, are anemic, hemorrhage, because we don't want tissue hypoxia. Now, intravenous dyes that radiographers sometimes put into the patients can give us low estimates for a period of time as well. Now, this probe is, is quite a bright light. Let me just try and show you again. You can see it a little time before it switches off. There we go. Um, it is quite a bright light. So um, if it's left in place for more than about four hours, it can cause burning. So we tend to move to another finger after, after a few hours. But of course, as is always the case in clinical practice, what we can never stress enough is, is don't treat the machine, treat the whole patient. So always look at this in the context of the patient. This is an aid. It's a very useful aid, but nevertheless, it's an aid. Now, we normally say that normal oxygen saturations are 95 or above. So I'm 98 at the moment. I'm quite happy with that. I can live with that. So 95 or, or, or above. And uh, if a adult is ill, we want to aim for saturations of 94 to 98%. So if the saturations are dropping below 94 and a patient's ill, for example, after a myocardial infarction, or after if a patient has sepsis, then we want to maintain the saturations at 94 to 98. Now, after a myocardial infarction is an interesting one. We used to put all patients on oxygen after an MI. It was absolutely routine. But actually, we know that's not the right thing to do. Uh, after a myocardial infarction, it's best to keep the uh, saturations between 94 and 98, because if there's a lot of oxygen in the heart muscle, uh, that can uh, cause uh, vasoconstriction in the small arterial supplying the myocardium. And we also know that very high amounts of ox oxygen can cause uh, oxidative stress damage, actually making the infarct worse. So 94 to 98%. If a patient's septic, keep, keep the saturations high as well. That, that's good in sepsis. Now, if a patient is retaining carbon dioxide, if they're CO2 retainers, for example, if someone's got a chronic respiratory condition, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, then we're happy with saturations of uh, 88 to 92, because these patients do adapt to lower oxygen saturations. 
So 90, uh, 88 to 92 uh, in uh, chronic carbon dioxide retainers, patients with hypercapnia or hypercarbia, it's the same thing. Hypercapnia and hypercarbia means, means the same thing. So 88 to 92 in these patients. In others, we would uh, aim for saturations of 94 to 98%. And now, of course, we call oxygen saturations the fifth vital sign. So temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, we've done from antiquity. But now we have this remarkably useful device, which is the fifth vital sign. And it becomes part of our track and trigger system. So part of the national early warning score that we use in the UK. So we'll, patients will score zero if their saturations are uh, 96 or above. Uh, 94 to 95% saturations they'll score 1, 92 to 93% saturations they'll score 2 and less than 91% saturations they'll score um, 3. And if we're giving the patient supplementary oxygen we add 2 for that as well. So as we've said in each of my red blood cells there's 270 million to 300 million haemoglobin molecules. And, and what this is telling me is that 99% of those haemoglobin molecules are attached to oxygen. Now each haemoglobin molecule can actually uh, carry four oxygen molecules. So it's quite amazing to think that 99% of my haemoglobin molecules in my erythrocytes are saturated with oxygen. So I think that means that my lungs are working at 99% efficiency, which is is really quite incredible. So um, I think I'll stop monitoring my saturations now. Um, but it's nice to know that my oxygen saturations are 99% and my heart rate is uh, 76.